So starting off, um, we have uh, um, very, very lucky to have Dave Hayden here from uh, Outboard uh, uh, Spatial Technologies. Um, and will be uh, the lecture, the first lecture will be um, sonic perception and reception. What is immersive sound? So Dave uh, has been working in uh, immersive spatialization for around 21 years, developing the uh, TMAX um, uh, spatial technologies. Um, and um, pretty uh, amazingly as well, we, Dave's background has come on live console mixing. Um, He's been, uh, he's worked uh, various different roles for Midas and SSL. Um, so that's a really great grounding for developing um, spatial technologies. So uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, hand over to Dave, who will be uh, going through this lecture. And then afterwards, we'll have a little bit of time for some questions. And just very quickly, um, any information we'll provide with regards to any texts or references uh, that we'll, we'll be discussing throughout, we'll make sure it's provided to you afterwards. But over to you, Dave. Thank you. Sonic temporal when a speech sound is removed in this demonstration, you will hear a sequence of higher amplitude, amplitude extraneous noise, such as a cough. Listeners generally hear the entire, the entire sentence as an intact, intact, even when they are told in advance the fainter level of the speech appearing to be missed. You will now hear an example accurately of this restoration effect. So, um, welcome. Um, my name's Dave, as Ben. Thank you very much for the intro. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the motives, aspirations, and some of the processes involved with, uh, with immersive. But of course, the first question we have to answer is what, what does it mean? <clears throat> um, predominantly, it's something that's become something of a marketing term, actually. And, and the, the word immersive can be applied, it seems, from my, my experience, to uh, anything from drapes to speakers to video screens to, uh, to of course, spatial environments. Um, the company I'm involved with, one of the owners of, we make a thing called Timex, and it's used in experiential presentation and performance markets to do basically manage generally multi-speaker multi systems and multi-source element stems to, to create um, spatial environments. And those can either be live performance uh, sources or, or playback sources. The, the, the three logos you see at the moment outboards the company that, that um, I'm involved with and uh, Timex is, the, is a product. And you'll notice Sova who are hosting our, our piece today. So just to break it down into where, where we come at this, uh, this pheno these phenomena, 3D localization is a very important part of, of immersion. This is the process whereby if you're looking at something in front of you and hearing it as well, it's important that it's, it's authentic or contextualized with what you see. And we're going to look at a bit about, in a minute, about how the senses all have to be kind of uh, synchronized in order for you to not, be, to not get confused or stressed by what you're hearing, seeing, experiencing. Um, the immersive audio bit, we tend to categorize as the stuff that's all around you. We used to be called surround, it's been called 360, and it depends on which generally which sector you're, you're, um, you're talking about. Um, and th this, that's a very important part of, of the, the immersive experience and the, the spatial kind of uh, paradigm. Panoramic hugeness is just something that we kind of invented to describe the, that transition from the pure fidelity orientated thing of stereo through to taking a multi-speaker system and creating a genuinely authentic panorama, both for vocals, choirs, orchestras and that or even um, electronic you know contemporary electronic music as well there is something uh, black and white different between having it separated out into a, a multi-channel spatial experience um, sorry multi-source spatial experience compared to it, it just coming out of stereo and we'll look at why that is um, in some for, for some uh, in some depth and then just to add a bit of kind of um, housekeeping to this when you start uh, undertaking these things in real life, you have to manage them. And, and so, for example, if you're talking about live performance and people wearing microphones, uh, where it's really important to try and make the sound come from where they actually are in real life, so you're seeing and hearing what you're seeing, we, c we can track those and uh, there's a product that, um, that we make, that, the technology that we make that can do that. And then generally it'll show control, the term that's used to describe everything from MIDI to OSC to contact closure ports and, and even UDP, XML messaging to basically make stuff happen in sync with video, with lights, with whatever, or just in the sequence of a show. So these are all important parts of the um, of, of actually creating that outcome of immersive, uh, immersive audio. 
So just taking it down to uh, basics for the moment, <clears throat> just have a little look about uh, at something, this, this corollary between reception and perception. Now, I actually first encountered this, interestingly enough, at the Immersed uh, project that was done at, at Ravensbourne. There was a lecture given by a very erudite person, and I, it just made an impact on me, this point about we receive an awful lot, but we actually perceive, we have, a, we have filters that allow us to perceive what we're able to and what we need to, to kind of either feel, experience, or have intelligibility or uh, the environment that we're in. This slide here is actually it intrigued me because it's actually a, a, um, a message sent to my to um, to my wife from a friend of hers who she used to guide as a runner because in fact he's blind and he actually is saying here almost describing a scene in a way that any of the rest of us would except he's his perception is almost ninety percent the same as ours would be but he can't see any of it and I just thought it, it just sort of settled in my brain as something that, that sums up this reception perception dichotomy quite uh, quite interestingly I mean what it what it boils down to is this there's a there's a world of information uh, out there and if you're holding a, a, a cell phone and a mobile phone in your hand you can literally access almost anything that's out there but we're designed as a sort of organic uh, entity to actually only be able to deal with a certain amount of it so we our brains have to um, do an awful lot of work in order to to perceive uh, contextually what it is that we need and what we require to, to actually work within the environment. And that's either in terms of communication or enjoyment or, or whatever. So the, this reception perception thing is really important. And there are, it's important to avoid conflicts within it in order to actually achieve the outcomes that we want. Now, I encountered in a little bit of, and I use the term loosely, research but very, very briefly, this concept of synchresis. And this is literally the concept of visual and uh, auditory and vi visual information being able to work together to convey completely different things. And so, for example, th th this very simple example here is the fact that if, they show, if we show you a picture of a car or a video of a car, we can make that sound like a fast car, a slow car, or even a damaged car. And that can, give it, that can create implications then in the way you're supposed to interpret a scene. And or we could take um, um, a limited amount of, uh, of audio tracks and turn them into a very big crowd by showing sh by showing you lots of people. You know, so it's it's one way or the other. You can imply stuff by by using visual and auditory cues that support each other. You know, and that's, that's a very interesting point about you know synchresis is one of those things that's important to know about in terms of synchronizing the senses or using one to support the other. Yeah, just to expand upon this uh, term synchrosis, um, so it was, I believe it was first used by uh, Michel Chion uh, in his, his seminal book, Audio Vision. Now, I would really recommend, highly recommend that if you haven't re read that book, especially if you have a particular interest in sound and the application of sound with media, um, it, is, um, it is some pretty radical um, concepts in there and it's, written in a really poetic way. I believe it was wrote in around 1990, um, and he speaks of this term as a telescoping um, between uh, synchronicity um, and synthesis. So it kind of gives you more of an idea of what, how that word come about, synchronicity. But he just kind of describes it as, um, uh, poetically describes it as the dancing shadow of sound removed from its original object and mm. displaced and placed onto something else. So it's quite poetic, as I said, it's quite poetically described, but he uses the example of uh, if you have a, a video of a piece of wood being chopped by an axe and you replace the sound with a baseball being hit mm. by a baseball bat, then the audience won't really uh, notice any different or associate that sound with, with, with that function. I mean, there, there's a separate de debate to be had about that, but fundamentally what Xion was uh, raising is, um, is this, we've moved into an epoch of this um, hyper-reality hyper or overly emphasised sound um, being used with sound and media, and we've been kind of... Uh, conditioned into this through, you know, many decades of the development of cinema, media, um, and now, you know, the uh, the power is in this this hyper real representation of sound in in image. But if we kind of move up to the present time, 
around 10 years later, um, uh, the French art theorist and social commentator, Nicolas Boriard, also talks this about the spectacular representation mm -hmm. in art. Um, and what he states that we're at a time where um, human beings aren't really truly impacted unless there's a, um, a spectacular representation. So I thought it was quite interesting um, how this, this kind of original Xion syncretist theme moves throughout time. And I just wanted to ask you, Dave, again, another 20, 20 years on from that, given your experience in the field, how, how do you kind of... Um, this this uh, had uh, this concept of um, hyper reality or the spectacular of sound in um, modern music and sound performance. How do you think that kind of um, um, theory sits now? Well, in, in a very kind of relatively mundane sense, uh, um, the but but actually very sort of. Uh, relevant if you look at this the simple concept of a theatrical production it's often described that you can light you can set a scene with with lighting you can describe it with scenography perhaps in the other or in the other way around you if you put um, a veranda or a couch on stage people know that that's a veranda or a couch or a living room but you then light it to create the, the daytime nighttime moonlit or not sort of thing if you then add something like sound to it, you can completely change any of those scenarios in terms of mood and emotion. And this is the bit, the bit that sound brings to the party in that con context is, is actually a, far more cerebral to some extent, mm, you know. Mm. And then on top of that, if there are people, if there are um, elements that you need to um, that focus on in, in there, like people speaking and three or four people on stage, uh, sound is very important for the focus and the intelligibility mm. that as results from that. So, mm. so in the in the context of you know where grabbing hold of the the control of these things in the modern day, it's become very very contemporary now and realise mm. that you have to manage those interplays in order to create uh, what's the, in, in, certainly in live performance is the willing suspension of disbelief. That so sort of seeing object it. sound as an object. Make it work. Make yeah. it work as it's yeah. supposed as it's supposed to. And um, and that is indeed why you things have all gone object based now yeah. rather yeah. than channel based. You know, in order to to so you can relate those to each other really. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Mm. So moving on. Um, about half the people that I show this to have normally seen this before, but it's, I'll play this a couple of times. Um, if you focus your vis visually on one, one side of the screen or the other each time I play it, it's been interesting to see what you think you're hearing. And then, and then I'll play it one last time and I'll get you to do something that will be slightly different. So just have a quick listen to this. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. And keeps flipping between the left and the right image. Ba, ba, ba. And then the minute you shut your eyes, if everybody shuts their eyes and hears it one more time. Ba, ba, ba. I think it's pretty obvious that at the last run through, you can everybody can tell what he's saying absolutely really clearly. But for the first couple of goes, it's probably a little bit confusing. And this is just something to sort of um, just throw you off off kilter for a minute. I just wanted to kind of show you how we can, our ears and senses can dis deceive us if we don't actually have all the information that we need to know what's going on. Um, here's another little trick that's interesting. Now, if you've got headphones on, this works very well. This is something that's called cocktail party effect. And this is about the simply the difference between hearing stuff um, let's say binaurally, but there's nothing binaural about this. It's just a mono stereo switch, really, here. But hearing stuff coming from different directions allows us to hear, to differentiate what we're hearing. And it's a, something called spatial unmasking, um, and it, it helps us to, towards intelligibility. So I'm just going to play this clip, actually, that you heard at the beginning. And this will be in mono. So there's two, two voices, it's the same voice, but talking about two different things, coming out of both channels at the same, uh, at the same time. And just... See how you get on with it for the first time round. It has been found that when a speech sound is removed in this demonstration, you will hear a sequence by a higher of different amplitude, amplitude extraneous noise, such as a car tone. Listeners which generally will hear the entire sentence as an intact, of even when they are told in advance the fainter levels of the tone appearing to be missing. You will now hear an example accurately being heard as an effect. 
And now I'm going to just play it again, but you'll notice something slightly different about it. It has been found that when a speech sound is removed in this demonstration, you will hear a sequence by a of higher amplitude extraneous noise, such as a cough. Tone, Listeners generally hear the entire sentence as an intact, illusion of even when they are told in advance, with the fainter level of the tone appearing to be missing. You will now hear an example of this phonemic restoration effect. Now, what's interesting about this is that most people find that they can actually sort of type, flip between the two bits of monologue and actually uh, understand what he's saying, um, whereas when they're both coming at you from the same direction, it's virtually impossible to do that. And when I do this demonstration on a multi-speaker system, I immediately fire up an orchestra and show them the difference between that in stereo, two speakers, and that across a properly, um, you know, spatially matrixed panorama. And it's, it's just eye-opening, really, because what you're, what you're hearing are multiple different things. First of all, we're, we're designed to be able to discern things coming. It's unnatural to hear sounds coming from both from directly in line with each other. The minute you separate them out, your brain can use all of the things it's been designed in from survival mechanisms and everything like that to actually to enhance intelligibility. There's also the, um, the very real effect of spatial unmasking. And this is something that, you know, taking something out of a stereo mix and mixing it in the, in the air, in space, so you balance it on a console, for example, but you mix it actually in air at people's heads, that's when you actually get the, um, get the, uh, the, the real spatial information. So essentially, this is an important part of why we do spatial audio, why we do spatial mixing. And it's just, uh, there's no effects on this at all. It's literally just mono stereo, just to show you another little kind of trick your brain does unless you take care. Yeah, yeah. I just want to uh, expand upon this, uh, if that's okay, Dave. Sure. But um, with regards to um, this psychoacoustic effect, it's interesting because obviously there is a psychoacoustic um, thing happening in our brains when we're interpreting the sounds, and it's really demonstrated there by the panning allows a lot more comprehension of individual and collective, and like you said, moving between the two. Do you think this is an influence why early orchestral music spaced out the musical instruments on the stage, or, you know, in the 60s and 70s, music producers started to work in more stereo, spatialised music? Is that why it can be perceived to be more rich and full? Because it's just a, the psychoacoustic effect of us being able to understand more elements because mm. they're not all in the middle. Well, certainly, one of the reasons for going to see an orchestra live is is to not have it squeezed through a stereo pair, right? And mm. and and there's more def definition and, between and the it, elements. And it's like I I sort of liken it to the waves on the beach. If you lie on the sh on the beach and shut your eyes, you'll hear what that first guy was hearing. There's some phenomenal panorama that mm. tells you this is a beach. This is not a speaker system. Mm. It, you can't reproduce it. That the little bits of waves, and certainly in the before there were mixing desks, people would mix an orchestra as you say, by laying them out that way. And the other, the, 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 both laying them out in, in the space, putting the loud bits at the back to be blunt, you know, mm. but also um, the guy with the baton was mixing it. And, he, mm. and actually they do to this day, as you, as you know. So yeah, I know, I know. very influential. And then of course in the electronic music domain, I mean, I, I think we were all, we can all remember the earlier stereo records and certainly the Beatles are a good example where they mm. didn't have pan pots so the drums were over there yeah, and the yeah over very there. and they thought that was all right some, there was some resistance wasn't there yeah. there was some you know oh, Phil Spector you, of and, course there was because it sounded dark yeah 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 it's crazy yeah. but I know just a, another small point there I know there's been some research and we're going to put up some of the uh, research that we're included in here afterwards mm. but um, which is to do with our evolutionary trace of our hearing because of um, we evolved um, uh, many centuries in cave in caves where there's a lot of sound reflections mm -hmm. so it's developed our um, audio mm -hmm. perception mm -hmm. to kind of be geared towards that mm -hmm. um, so there's a really interesting kind of provenance mm -hmm. to this cocktail party effect and our and our yearning for spatialized sounds mm -hmm. well this this gets its name from talking to a guy here at a party and being able to tell he's talking to you as well. I, I didn't about, go to he's talking many, about you as well. I didn't you know. go to too many cocktail parties. But it's, it's honest, hearing but... someone talking about you when you're talking about something else. But anyway, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's an interesting gag and it's one you don't need any equipment for. You know, you, yeah. you can grab these two sound clips and show it to anybody. And you know, on a commercial, on a mercenary level, when we communicate, we're suggesting sound designers communicate with producers as to why to do spatial audio. Mm. We say just play them this. 
because it will confuse them initially. But then I it will make them think. There's creative opportunities to misuse this as well. Sure, sure. To yeah. create confusion if that's your intention. But it's so. intended to show you the difference between how, what's yeah. going on in your brain when you unmix stuff. And unmixing yeah. is actually part of what we do, funny enough. Yeah, very powerful. So you, um, you alluded to this, um, Ben, and this is an interesting sort of, sort of side sidebar really to this whole discussion to do with sensory modality and um, all this means is essentially what do we get from the oral and the visual information and in fact you'll see in a minute the, the actual physical performance um, aspect of, of, of behavior behaviors of, um, by, by musicians and it, it turns out there was a little bit of research done um, on this and they did this interesting thing where they recorded um, a performance, um, made two video recordings uh, of, um, ha happened to be Debussy's Claire de Lune. And in both cases, they had, they created congruent and incongruent content. So what that really means is they created good quality audio, good quality video, and then they made four different mixes of it. One with both of the, two, two congruent ones. So both were good quality or both were bad quality. And two incongruent ones where one was good quality audio, not so good quality video and good quality video, not so good quality audio. And it turns out that the good quality video one wins every time. Mm. So even though we are, we, you'd imagine that we would tune into the high quality audio because it's, it's actually audio we're, we're, listen, we're watching, it's music. It's not actually a, a visual thing that we're looking at, but we're um, experiencing. Just having the quality of the, the, the video better meant, made it actually sound to people's ears, to people's brains, sorry, perception. Mm that it was actually a better performance. And added to that, to take it even further, and this may be a bit more, bit more obvious, actually, but they then uh, took this a bit further and then said, well, what happens if we um, change the way people, the, the, the performer behaves? And so they made the performer uh, uh, do the performance with an actual, uh, completely, they call it deadpan, so mm. no kind of emotion, no expression. And, Perhaps not surprisingly, when they saw much more kind of passionate movement in the in the process, mm. uh, and facial expressions, etc., um, that actually communicated uh, to people's mm. enjoyment as well. So, there's this is just really kind of pointing out that there are a number of sensory modalities that contribute to our perception of what's going on, mm. the visual, the auditory, and it turns out the behavioural as well. And of course, mm. I think you're aware, been aware of some melodic. Um, yeah, I mean, as well. this, it touches upon some of the research, my research area, and sensory modality is a really interesting thing. But I guess to come back to this point of deadpan performance, I think you could relate that to maybe in the mid 2000s when the laptop became introduced into the mm. live mm. electronic performance, and there was a bit of a backlash mm. against that because it, it was, again, not the same as playing a, a bass or a guitar mm. or a musical instrument. Mm. So these sensory modality influences really influence one another. And I know from my own research in uh, the rhythm and the brain and language, for example, um, comprehension, language comprehension in the brain is actually independent of sensory modality mm. um, because of it is detected by rhythm, prosody, rhythmical grouping in the brain. The brain is a, almost a precognition part. So it would be really interesting, or well, some of you might want to explore this in your essays or in your projects, but <coughs> looking at the bar far example, for example, uh, but maybe having a sentence or, you know, lyrics to a song mm -hmm. uh, and having different visual cues to see how that would be affected. Because I know there was some studies done with sensory modality with Charles Spence, for example, who looked at colour and flavour Mm -hmm. um, for Heston Blumenthal. So uh -huh. they found that the studies of different colours will make things taste sweet or more sour. And there's also some studies uh -huh. done with different frequencies making things taste more sweet or sour. Mm -hmm. So there is some real interesting sensory modality. I think that isn't massively explored on the mainstream level and quite fun to actually experiment with yeah. in, in projects. I think there are some food and uh, immersion yeah. over, overlaps going on, and, as I've heard about, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, brilliant, Very thanks. interesting. And, and this is just a sort of something to bring this all down to earth, the, the focus part of what we just uh, discussed. This was a piece of, in, the, in the Stage magazine, which is a magazine that producers read and, and talent reads, so it's not a technical magazine. And uh, it was written on, uh, in, 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 lay, in lay terms to kind of, to be blunt, to broke, 
to, to promote a bit of technology, the bit you can't see off the bottom of the screen actually mentions the Timex product. And I, I know this because I wrote it, and actually, to be, to be honest about it. But what I, was trying, what I did with this when I, when I researched it was to try and push the buttons in the production community and the performance community about what it is that, they, that bothers them, that stimulates them. And certainly theatre critics are a good start because there's a lot of florid terminology used in, in theatre critical um, pieces. Um, disembodied voices from the heavens is a good one, yeah. you know, and that's one of the things that they we, we, we talk about. But mm -hmm. we discovered um, from ha um, having lots of these systems deployed as, as it happens in Scandinavia that the actors got used to being spatialized on stage mm -hmm. and they found that the room, because if you're on stage and you're talking into a microphone, there's a, there's a time difference in the room responding back to you, what's coming yeah. out of the sound system. They found that if the sound system followed them around the stage with a tracking system, etc., yeah. that that dis disconnect from the audience was was went away. Mm. And they would go to another theatre, because they all saw their job in actors, right? Have you got a tracking system? Because mm. we prefer it. And then you have this element of, so the so reason microphones were, were disliked by performers was because of that disconnect with the audience. The reason they were disliked by producers was because of that disembodied voices from the heavens thing that the critics would say. But you have this problem where for an actor to properly do the, his range or her range, bathos to pathos, they've also got to protect, project up into the to, mm. the, to the to the gods, right? So if there's a sound person doing that for them, it really means that they can act within their full range. So actors would act, he's, one of them's quoted in saying, I've, I started to get really used to having a microphone because I could really act rather than have to project, you know? Mm, mm. So it comes at, it, it, this comes at you, this discussion from all angles. And what mm. this was meant to convey was nowadays the spatialization that eliminates this, oh, I hate microphones. I mean, you know, the, the, because it, it's all coming from up there, which Can is I of course just wrong. Just ask you a really quick question about, because yeah. it's a really interesting point that you make. Do you work, um, obviously in this, uh, instant is you know very uh, you can you can understand it makes complete sense uh, and also enabling the performer to perform to their full ability mm. because a performance at the end of the day can't happen without the reciprocal audience so mm. yeah, yeah. Uh, the audience is a, is a, is a part of that performance mm. do you work with musicians or live acts to do the similar sort of thing because this is quite interesting for me because I, I performed on stages and and often moving around and obviously the sound source is always very static. But mm. do, you, do you work not just theatre, but with musicians in this way as well? Well, it, it depends on the musician. And to, to put, put this in perspective, as we'll see, there's, this, is, this is not a magic trick. There's some physics involved yeah. uh, and some boundaries. And if it's a very high energy sound reinforcement situation, like mm. a rock band or whatever, yeah. then it's... You, to get the localization to work is difficult because the source at the relative to the amplification is the difference is too big, right? Yeah, so this yeah. is more for what we might call reinforcement. Having said that, we do work with progressive metal acts, but more in the spatial it's movement of, of sound around us. And, yeah. and, and we do, you know, we've done EDM and we've done electronic music, people, mm. but it's more, less to do in this aspect of it and more to do with the, the hyper real side of yeah. it that you talk about. So. MIDI triggers and things like that to make sound move around and that kind of thing. So definitely, yes, I mean, you know, um, that kind of thing is part of our agenda, but it's, sl it's slightly different to this. Mm. You know, this is all about um, the contract that mm. is entered into by when you buy the ticket. Mm. And that is the, the comprehension of the what's audience. Been said the audience and the deserves actor. a lot, a real, a real yeah. performance, and yeah. they will get that if they've, they've got, you're getting the full range off the actor. And you're getting proper localization, specialization. Not only in an amphitheater, there will be projection, which takes a lot of their energy. But not mm. only that, there is a form of spatialization that happens if it's indoors, for example. There will be reflections that mm. could be distracting. Mm. So yeah, it's really interesting to hear about. Well, how amphitheaters that can help. Are, the design basically is amplified, isn't it? Yeah. But, but this was one of those things that you know was just a, a little uh, piece to put out into that that domain there. So we're often asked how many speakers do you need to make an immersive system? It's an obvious question, um, but, but it has a very vague answer, unfortunately, because it always depends on what you're trying to achieve. And the answer is not always, um, you know, that, here's a couple of examples, for example. Um, that, that's a, a, sort of the, a sort of circus type of arrangement. It's not actually a circus, it's a, a musical theatre uh, show and what's these are loudspeaker um, uh, plots by the way and and what was happening here there was audience around the outside 
there was audience in the middle, so that's why there are speakers pointing in towards the middle, and you can see there's some at the back, um, and there's a band on the stage at the top of the screen. And But the, the performers were actually moving on a, on a kind of circular conveyor belt around the audience in the middle, and, and so they were being tracked, so the lights followed them, and the sound had to follow them as well. So you need these speakers pointing at everybody in order to have the, manage the, uh, the spatialization. This is a typical uh, proscenium theater. If you go to see a play in the West End, there'll probably be, a, most, most of them will have something like this going on in terms of different speaker systems, doing vocals, front fills, for the people in the front, for a different music system, to mm. vocal system, um, there are balcony delays and surrounds for effects or, or reverbs and stuff. And so that's a, that's a fairly contemporary, that's actually the, the old Vic in, in Waterloo. Oh, wow. that's, that's an arena system, not very contemporary, very conventional, delays, out shooters, all, probably all line arrays to get coverage. But you can see a little bit of spatial system at, at, on the, on the, in front of the stage there with the five channel doings there. Mm. I and can then, see that's the O2 there. Yeah, that it? is yeah, the O2 arena. This is, a, this is a, simply a planetarium mm. where it's got to be you know, very uniform all around. Mm. And, yeah. uh, I mean, I just wanted to kind of uh, lay a little providence on this. I just mm. thought it'd be interesting to kind of mm. in, um, bring up some history. But uh, I know that from a sound art uh, perspective, which this is my academic yeah, field, yeah. that the um, what a lot of um, his, art historian, music historians believe to be the first spatialised electronic music performance in 1958 at the mm. World Fair in Brussels, mm. sponsored by Philips, I believe. Oh, yeah. But the music concrete uh, movement there, and they would use tape manipulation mm. and a lot of movement and spatialisation. So Edgar Varese created La Poe, La Poe Poem Electronique, which uh, again a lot of people do kind of um, state is one of the first electronic uh, music compositions, especially when it comes to spatial performance. Although, you know, there, there is some evidence that suggests there's some in non Western countries that uh, mm -hmm. happened before that. Right. But um, he used a reputed 350 speakers mm -hmm. uh, to perform uh, at the World Fair. I just thought it would be in a nice kind of to bring that up and sort of, you know, how do you feel now, considering that there was um, uh, someone using 350 speakers back in 1958 mm -hmm. um, to where we are now and mainstream music performance? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think we're sitting as a culture when it comes to the integration of contemporary vanguard spatial technologies? Well, a lot of the answer to that is is, is technology and also demand and, and if, do you think that vision. we've got a long way to catch up well, from that kind of vision or do you think that it's there and it's more embedded the electronics is there to do it now much yeah. easier than obviously okay. it was for any of those guys there was uh, the first of this spatial reinforcement as we call it of the stage was done in the 70s by a thing called Delta Stereophony which came yep. out of, of uh, East Germany um, Gerhard Steinker, Feltz, and Wolfgang Ernert, who is the daddy of Ease, which is a speaker analysis yeah, software. Yeah. Um, sadly, the first two are not with us anymore, but the, Wolfgang very much is, and he still is a practitioner and actually oh. a Timex lover, as it happens. But he he and his consultancy in Berlin that does this sort of thing still, and that was patented in, in the, back in those days, mm. you know, and that was all based on Haas because they yeah. had discovered that what Haas was doing. Many yeah, but years that's before. great because we're going to be speaking about uh, Haas yeah. effect, which we will yeah. get to. Um, Fantasia, 1940, yeah. had an eight-channel sound system and yeah, an eight-track. I've not heard. I didn't hear until you told me earlier. Yeah, yeah. and, that, and that was called Fantasound. And so, although that doesn't answer your question, it's interesting yeah, to know no, that there was context. some insanity going on there. And they, they, there were there were ten different versions of this because they had some pitfalls. I, I was yeah. reading about it the other day. There were the, the final version had 400 vacuum tubes. It says wow. on Wikipedia. So there you go. <laughs> so, so they had. Imagine. I mean, you could do it now quite easily but it was a quite an elaborate thing and they toured it for a year and then gave up and remixed it in mono until later on it mm. came I guess I guess we're done in Atmos but the the, the um to answer your question, you know, there yeah. are many boxes now, and of course yeah. there's networked audio. So these speakers can all have, have an audio network going around yeah. them, so you can get discrete feeds to every, every speaker. It's not hard to do this. Uh, yeah, I guess know. where I was trying to lead it, maybe not being uh, that, that lucid in my intention, mm -hmm. is that from my interpretation that there, um, there isn't as much... Um, from my experience of uh, being a performer and uh, being a music lover and an art lover, on the mainstream circuit when you go into a concert or when you go to a music performance, mm -hmm. I think that although 
I th- you, you know, based upon speaking to you, the spatial technologies are there, mm. but they're kind of utilised in a kind of, um, not necessarily at the forefront of the discussion, mm. um, and that there's huge opportunities for more spatial performance um, rather than things just kind of be presented for them, like mm. the artists working with the technologies, for mm. example. And I just feel like after doing more research into your technology, I mean, I, I have obviously worked with your technology previously, which we'll mm. speak about, but um, I just think there is a great opportunity for new students, new artists, mm-hmm. to really get into this technology and use it as a creative opportunity to not only have a practical application where everyone can hear it clearly mm. or the or the performer is able to perform and not have to focus on reflections and having more of a intimate relationship with the audience i think there's still profound opportunity to use these systems mm. in, in in a creative sense like mm. as a for music performance there is and some people are a lot of it's in the commercial world a lot of it's economics you yeah. know can do they, do they that they want to pay the for the production. Yeah. Fortunately, in the domain of, of art, that's normally not an issue. And there is obviously there are limits, yeah, but yeah. normally the motivation is to is to just do it. You know. Yeah. Um, but you know, one of the things that that we we pride ourselves on is that we can actually achieve phenomenal specialization with a lot less speakers than some of yeah. the 350 that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Less and that, is more sometimes. And the, you know, yeah. give an example, you know, there's a, that's a, a Timex system plugged into a Dolby Atmos studio, oh, yeah. right? That's a contemporary Dolby Atmos studio in the West End. Just to do some of the trials, they were interested in what it did. Mm. But here's a kind of thing that you can present that the same show on that system in in a in, in and this would of, be replicable by students to have how yeah. many? So how many speakers we got? Is it a there's, ten? There's basically eight there. Eight speakers. Fact, we've done more or less that at Ravensbourne. So this before. is something which could be explored and at so the, university. And so because it's object based, and we're going to get to that in a minute, just yep. to introduce. But most people are familiar with that term. You you can. It's sort of semi portable between these things. In, in the in the case of you know where I come into this, we're used to dealing with multiple speaker systems and multiple audience. We're about making the same experience for everybody in the audience, yeah. eliminating the sweet spot and be that in surround or yeah. be it in the spatial panorama. But this yeah. is kind of that how many speakers concept. It, it's um, it's not, it's, it's about what you're trying to do and what where you're trying to do it yeah. and who for, you know. Perfect, yeah. So, so just to go into this in a little bit more detail, here are those pictures again. Um, I mentioned these the object-based thing um, in the in the paradigm that that I'm that we're talking about within Timex. We take all these speakers, and this basically are software screenshots from within the the, soft, the Timex software, and we create objects in the so, in the software called image definitions. So it means that you you look at basically an, um, a the objective of where do I want the sound to come from? I want it to come from over there, and then you th- th- get the software to glue all these speakers together to make that work for everybody in the audience or in the, they may be actually not an audience sitting out in an auditorium, they may be an audience milling around in a mm. experiential uh, experience and exhibition, exhibition or something like that. Uh, we do a lot of car shows, you know, literally big yeah. trade show booths with, for car brands and stuff. It could be people sitting at a banquet with surrounded by screens and they're having to, we're trying to create an immersive environment there. But within that, that space, there will be these objects that have been created in the software called image definitions, and they are literally what they say. They're, I will want the sound at some point to come from over there, make all these speakers do that for me. And then, then you move away from what contemporary is called a channel-based system, which is make the sound come out of that speaker to make the sound come out of that point in space yeah. for everybody in the room. And that that's becomes object-based, right? And so you end up, you know. However, there are some challenges, and this is one of the things that we need to, to kind of look at before we kind of arrive at, at the how do we do this. We've kind of talked about some of this stuff already, spatial unmasking, et cetera, expanding the sweet spot. Um, but this is about, you know, why bother? It's kind of a summary of, of why we should do this. Making sure that the, the senses are all synchronized, making sure that you don't conflict between what you see, what you hear, making sure that if it's a live performance, you are in a theater show, for example, you are maintaining that suspension of disbelief, that authenticity, that that's yeah. the, then at the other end of the spectrum, the, what you, you mentioned, describe as the hyper real, where you're trying to create a synthetic kind of outcome that you have c- enough control over the sound system to make that as immersive or as as, as engaging. To reinforce an element. Or as, em- as enveloping yeah. for everybody equivalent in, yeah. in, in the room. And we'll look at an example of that later on to do that. But in order to deal with this, we have this phenomenon that we have to overcome called precedence. And this is where this harsh effect thing you've heard me mention comes in. Mm. Um, now, 
um, Ben was talking about us evolving in caves and, and forests and stuff. And part of the reason we, we're here is, to, is that we learn how to survive. Mm -hmm. And the Haas effect is part of that mechanism. It's, it's the phenomenon whereby we localise to what we hear first, actually, rather than what we hear loud, loudest. Yeah. Very often, the, the, the foot sound we hear first is the loudest, but it can often be very close, especially mm -hmm. in very reflective environments. Mm -hmm. But if there's a source of danger, from coming from over there, we need to go over the, over the other way. And so the Haas effect is built into us in order for us to, our brain is designed to take separate arrival times of a sound. And that by that, I mean the source of the danger and then all the reflections off the rocks and the trees and, yeah. the, and the walls of the cave or whatever. And to know that the, f the first sound is, tells us where the danger is. And it, although it integrates them all together in one sound, it can also localize very accurately to where yeah. that first sound come from. So we know where to go to survive. Now, when we start, if we roll forward to present day, when we start putting microphones in front of things and putting it through speakers, and the speaker next to your ear, or a speaker yeah. hanging hanging in front of an audience, this works against us actually. Yeah. So the, the thing that we all know of as the pan pot is only able to change the level coming out of the different speakers, however many there are, and you have more touchscreen pan pots now that can do lots of speakers at the same time or joysticks and stuff. It's the same thing applies. If you only deal with the level, you're only ever dealing with a very sweet spot in the middle of the room, yeah. right? So, yeah. and this works in surround as much as it does in on the frontal panorama. So the Haas effect is something that we have to grab hold of and control. Otherwise it will control us and we will not be able to create the spatialization, be it the immersive surround thing or the spatial panorama that we're trying to do. And within the, this domain, there are some boundaries. And um, within those boundaries, there's a, there's a, a boundary that, that creates comb filtering and there is a boundary that creates uh, um, echo um, as well. But I'm just going to demonstrate the Haas effect to you very quickly. Yeah, sure. If you happen to have your headphones on. We're yeah, get play. your headphones on for yeah. this. This is really... Uh, Forget about what's on screen, but it'll, you'll see <laughs> down on the bottom, this delay line on the bottom. As I do these three separate slides, you'll hear this voice in mono first, and then it will be delayed on one side and it'll be delayed on the other. But just have a listen to what you hear through these three different slides. And I promise you that what you will be hearing in terms of your amplitude will be exactly what you see on the screen there. And it's it, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to it when I play, start playing the, uh, the, the next two slides. So this first one is just mono, just so you know what you're going to be hearing. The battle honours of Blenheim are proudly inscribed in the Great Hall of the Hospital, as are Ramillies, Oudinard and Malplaquet. But the cost in life and limb was often high, and the waiting lists grew longer to join the pensioners. Vacancies were not only created by death. When George I, Elector of Hanover, succeeded Queen Anne in 1714, the tide of Jacobite resentment lapped the wars of Chelsea and washed over pensioner Hammett. So this next one, which I'll play, we're going to put two milliseconds of delay on the right, in your right ear. So this, what you're hearing is still the same as you see on the waveform in terms of amplitude, but the, your right ear is, is, is delayed. And it's just interesting for you to, to hear what happens because you should find that, that it's panning pan to the left. But as it's playing, just lift the left speaker away from your ear and you'll suddenly hear it come back on the right. I'll just play this and I'm gonna do it the other way around as well so you can try it both ways. The battle honors of Blenheim are proudly inscribed in the great hall of the hospital as are Ramillies, Oudinard, and Malplaquet. But the cost in life and limb was often high, and the waiting lists grew longer to join the pensioners. Vacancies were not only created by death. When George I, Elector of Hanover, succeeded Queen Anne in 1714, the tide of Jacobite resentment lapped the wars of Chelsea and washed over pensioner Hammett. And here's the other way around, just so that you know. We're just going to put this, do the same thing, but on the, on the delay on the left. Just two milliseconds of delay, and it does work with one as well, but I put two milliseconds for a reason that will... The battle yeah. honours of Blenheim are proudly inscribed in the Great Hall of the Hospital, as are Ramillies, Oudinard and Malplaquet. But the cost in life and limb was often high, and the waiting lists grew longer to join the pensioners. Vacancies were not only created by death, when George I, Elector of Hanover, succeeded Queen Anne in 1714, the tide of Jacobite resentment lapped the wars of Chelsea and washed over pensioner Hammett. So that's the same amplitude on both, in both ears, but it's just delayed two milliseconds on the left or the right. And you can probably hear it, it pretty much fully pans it over to one side. And 
I don't know if it, who knows the answer to this question, but two milliseconds is actually about two feet or two thirds of a meter. And how, how big is two feet? Well, if you think about it in real life, it's the distance between your head and the person who's sitting next to you in the theater. Mm -hmm. So what this is really telling you is that if you're trying to make stuff sound right, if you get this to work in the right, right way, if you're trying to make stuff sound right for everybody in the room, you actually need to manage this because every, everybody in that room is getting a different um, immersive experience, or sorry, spatial experience, depending on where they're sitting. And this is why, actually, you'll have noticed if you go to a, a gig and the, the snare drum is normally panned in the center, but if you're anywhere off left of center or right of center, you'll hear it coming out of that, that channel of the PA. And you know, you'll, then you'll very often hear the, the reverbs and the effects or the keyboards will sound very stereo, mm. but the vocals will always be the mono bits. And a lot of stereo mixes, most of it's, a lot of it's mono, as you know, and then there's mm. bits of it are stereo. And you'll hear it go to stereo and then go to mono, but out of the speaker you're nearest to. So if we're trying to make frontal panoramas sound realistic and also surrounds sound realistic, you're always going to be drawn to the speaker that's nearest to you. So if, if something's in surround on your left, you're going to be drawn to it on the left or the right. And so if we manage these delays, it, it allows us to actually to create a much more enveloping and a much more realistic surround or frontal panorama. That's something you could re reproduce, the students could reproduce by playing a piece of music in a space and walking around the space, certain yeah, elements. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you, yeah. you, can, you don't need a delay line to do this. You can sit in front of two stereo just speakers and just push one of them a foot away and you'll hear it all coming out of the left and you'll go, oh dear, I didn't realise that. <laughs> so, you know, if you don't manage delays in, in multi-speaker systems with, across a whole audience area, you will get... And there'll be basically one seat in the middle of each row that will be getting the proper effect. That's a really important point for people yeah. with home studio setups, actually. Yeah. If you've got your active monitors set up and, you, and they're not actually correctly level, if you've got one further back and forward, could you have phase, uh, some phase? Well, in no, your, pan, your panning won't be right. It'll just so, be off. You know, and if there's a delay on one of them, you'll be, you'll, the metres won't make sense anyway. Yeah. So just to look at this in, in actual numbers, and this is as technical as it gets, don't worry. I mentioned these boundaries. Um, you, could, you heard it pan after two milliseconds, but I, if, you were, if you were hearing that out of loud speakers, because you could hear both speakers at the same time, you'd hear a little bit of comb filtering. So all the way up to about eight, 10 milliseconds, and it's to do with the wavelengths and what the, what the, the notch that the cancellation is. It starts at one millisecond, about 500, two milliseconds, 250, and it drops an octave each time you double the over delay. Mm. And so by the time you get to eight, 10 milliseconds, you're out of band for vocals, which is what we're talking about I here. See. So from 10 to 25, um, you're gonna get a, a region where you can use this uh, proactively to create localization and imaging on a stage or in surround. And um, this echo perception boundary, it varies depending on high frequency content, transient content, so it's a bit of a multivariable thing. This is where our brains primitive uh, man and woman were designed to treat the secondary arrivals as a different sort of bit of information. Mm. Um, instead of a survival mechanism, it was to teach us about our environment. You mentioned the cave, jungle, indoors, outdoors, water. Safety, not safe. Multiple, yeah. multiple echoes is what we call reverb. So we would yeah. now, from that reverb, tell if there was water nearby or okay. if there were outdoors yeah. or indoors. So, and so it's um, a different bit of information. This also only works within a six to eight dB window. So we have these two kind of boundaries, a level boundary where the secondary arrival can be 8 dBs louder and delayed correctly, you'll hear the primary arrival. This means we can get 8 dBs out of a speaker of a voice that's on stage and, and that we'll still hear the voice coming from where they're on stage or the violin or whatever mm. it is. That's quite a lot of amplification, but when you ask me about, you know, maybe heavy, it's a lot loud music musicians where that's the boundary that stops us really yeah. making this work. However, we do do that with, 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 um, with louder music. We just put on stage on stage anchors to reinforce the acoustic sound and then we can do it. But that's another, that's for another lesson. But just know. before we move on to yeah. how you um, implement some of these theories and concepts within the, the Timex mm -hmm. technologies, I just want to come back and summarise the overall psychoacoustic effects or psychoacoustic phenomena mm -hmm. as a whole. 
the precedents, the Haas. I know previously you said that a lot of the technology is based on these psychoacoustic phenomenon. Um, but things like phasing and beating, we, in our separate discussion, we mm -hmm. we spoke about beating uh, the inversion of sign tones mm -hmm. to create uh, audio, or, or, audio hallucinatory or illusionary effects in the brain. Um, I know that you've done a lot of work with um, uh, Professor John Wynne, mm -hmm. who's a, um, an academic eye star studied with uh, at LCC uh, and I also um, I assisted his installation or for installation number two for <coughs> high and low frequencies which mm. using your technology mm. around 10 years ago at the Angus Hughes mm. um, gallery in Homerton um, that used um, hearing aids and uh, which was left by his uh, father I believe after he passed on um, and the feedback from that using your spatial technologies to create this beating or this you know, rhythmical sound, which is which is actually being created by our brains in our brains um, f through these psychoacoustic effects. Um, so we all kind of most students will know about bass cancellation, phasing, these kind of things. But what, uh, would you just give us a little bit more information about the work you do with artists as well as the commercial applications? Because these obviously can be used as creative opportunities to create these cerebral works. And I know you've done stuff with John Wynne, for example. Well, yeah, I mean, John, John's used it as a, as a multi-channel distribution system and also to move sound, and not in that particular case, but certainly he's done sound design on theatrical productions where he's done that. And um, obviously the beating is more about the, uh, the co you know, the um, interference between two very close frequencies. It's yeah. not so much to do with this, yeah. but but he he likes to use that to create a bit of bathos, to create a bit of tension. I know, um, certainly at the low end, frequency end. But he's he's always been interested about uh, putting stuff in the sp in the space correctly, and of course, having a timex there means and being object based means that he's not going to be um, subjected to the constraints that that the Haas effect applies, mm. you know, imposes upon you if you don't use, I mean, essentially what Timex is, is electronically is a delay matrix. So we've been talking yep. about delay times to make things work quickly. This just means that you can, if he wants to sort, put sources in it, in fact, Timex plays audio back inside, so you can use it as, a, as the playback medium, but you mm. don't have to. Um, whatever, it's a live source or, a, or, a, or an onboard source, you, it means you can make it come from the right place for everybody in the room mm. uh, by using this delay matrix technology, creating objects, delay matrix objects, that mean that you're saying, I want it to come from over there, regardless of where anybody's in the room, and I point speakers in the right direction to make that happen, essentially. Mm. So I think that's where he, he appreciates that and, you know, has used it. And, I, I'm, we're, and we've worked with other artists. I'm working with an artist at the moment on a project where it's multi-track music and it's going to be not made into a mix but into a, a surprising kind of experience of something that's actually very familiar yeah. to people. It's a contemporary sort of um, artist from way back. Um, and that will be also using the same thing. We won't, although there will be, there'll be obviously speakers visible, they will be, each speaker will be the focus for an image definition object that mm. the other speakers will be contributing to. So wherever you are in the room, you'll know that it's coming from over there because of the, the, the image definition objects. You know? Oh, fantastic. So this basically is you, this informs the way the software does the localization. This, just so you know, this 10 to millisecond, millisecond to 25 millisecond region is essentially a, 50, a five meter uh, zone on a, on a stage or in an orchestra or whatever. And it, it means that we don't have to change delays we can set a set of delays on all the speakers to make sure that everybody hears a sound coming from within that zone, um, within that 10 to 25 milliseconds after the acoustic sound and, they, and within six to eight dBs of it um, in terms of amplification, and we will still localize to it. And so this means that we can do minimal amount of inter, inter, intervening with the performance mm. in order to make the localization work. And it just informs the way Timax gets involved with it. But what this does, what this results in is, and this is perhaps getting a little bit outside of the, uh, the more kind of um, perception, uh, conception thing into the actual process side of what we're doing. We mentioned at the beginning, we look at processes. Mm -hmm. When you start doing spatial specialization, you're no longer mixing sound in stereo or onto a bus or onto 5.1 as is, as is contemporary. You are you're essentially creating a different type of sound system where you're mapping the original sound sources all the way back from where they are in their space or are meant to be in the, in the virtual space if they're, if they're hyper real 
uh, sound mm. effect type things, and you're mapping them via speaker locations to seating positions and adding some harsh effect overlay to make the imaging work. So all of the speakers are contributing, contributing to the imaging, which will be multi-position. You can have a thousand pan positions in Timex easily, mm. uh, or you can have eight. You know, it depends mm. on what you're doing. But all the speakers will be contributing to that, and they will be delayed essentially matrixed so that wherever you're sitting the sound will come from the right place and this is where these image def definition objects come into play that yeah. they are essentially portable delay matrix presets that you can that it, it works out for you based on those pretty drawings you saw before of all the speakers mm -hmm. um, and then you manage these because uh, in, in most cases a show or a presentation has got stuff that changes um, we manage these multiple time alignments to, to, to make the, uh, the sound come from the right place and then we vary it as things move around. Mm -hmm. So that can be done either with cues driven by things like MIDI very often or OSC or UDP messages or even the stage tracking, you know, for, yeah. for performance. Um, so looking at this in finally in the context of, of, of where the real world, here's that drawing again, but the whole screen, you'll see that screen again. This is what's called pan space in Timex, where the speakers are imported. And then on top of that, we create these uh, image definition objects. So the little white blobs that you can see on there are actually the objects that make the sound come from that, that position in space. So the top left screen has actually got a virtual stage laid out with, I don't know what there's about, 18 of them there, which we've just randomly put across the stage. And all the little coloured objects are the more familiar input source objects that you see in other softwares, you know, Dolby Atmos and whatever. And it's interpolating, but that's actually an orchestra, so there's a string section on the left, woodwinds and horns on the right. And what happens is if you stand anywhere in the room, as you move across that, that the strings always stay over there. The harsh mm -hmm. effect doesn't draw you to the right-hand side or the left-hand side, depending on where you are. Oh, so, wow. so it just creates a much broader and more realistic, authentic uh, spatial panorama for everybody in the room. On the right-hand side, um, you can see the same, same uh, dis distribution of image definitions, but we're now using those surround ones that you can see, um, you know, front, left, right, side, rear, and everything. And those trajectories are panning effects. So these are stuff moving around, could be electronic music or sound effects or whatever. And so this is used, you know, this would be a kind of EDM type of track where there are no rules. You're not now looking at, it's got to be like an orchestra. It's, it's, it's actually now, this based. is now what's yeah. in my head and yeah. I'm going to put it on here. So, and these great thing about these is you can draw them and there's a thing called a timeline, which allows you to schedule them um, as well and sync them up to MIDI and stuff like that. And just to uh, put this in perspective, Time Timex is a box. Uh, there's a whole web, web page about it if you want to know more about it. But it's a multi-channel box with FPGA in it and a playback of audio and it can hold these different input um, and output. So it operates as like a hard disk um, it's, no, recorder it's to, not, to playback. How many channels are there? It's 64 or 32, but okay. it's actually a, primarily it's a, a special processor. Yeah. But it has built in, if you want to use it, playback. Uh, but actually people use it a lot more for in putting sources in from the outside world, either playback or, or live sources. And, yeah. and, and it's the experiential market where we get into being playback, like the Milan Expo and places like that and that kind of thing. And does it work with ambisonic set, set up? So you, if you had vertically stacked speakers? If you, if, uh, we have played back an ambisonic rendered piece in it. And yeah. then, then what we've done is played it through image definitions, if you like, rather than virtual, virtual speakers rather than real speakers that yeah. represent those positions. Okay, yeah, so then it, it has replicated. I, I wouldn't claim it to be empirically accurate or anything yeah. like that, but then we're not in that world. We're in yeah. a sensory environment environment at that point yeah. it sounded great actually yeah. so you know but it I was think where, be some nice things to yeah. experiment with you know because so the m and the vr are just playback ones for yeah. for museum and actually vr is we'll see in a minute it's for theme parks so we'll skip through this is just what the fpga does it's stuff that the matrix can do one of the things that some of you may be asking is he's talking about delay imaging here and changing delays with the sound going through it this is very often illegal you'll hear a glitching right well one of the special sources in here is the spatial morphing that it does with the delays is some very, very complex holistic algorithms going on inside the box where it analyzes at a sample level the transient and dynamic, sorry, the transient and spectral content of the oh, wow. uh, dynamic spectral content of the, the audio. And it chooses between several different uh, spatial mor uh, delay morphing uh, oh. algorithms. So it's able to d decide which algorithms to use depending on what's going through it. And, and that's it, all real time. And that's in, in real time, yeah. Oh, wow. So, And we're working on a spatial reverb, which will be even more fascinating. So just, I'm just um, 
going a little bit fast because I'm aware of the time and we don't want to take up <laughs> too much of your time here. I mentioned stage tracking before. Um, we thought this would be interesting to just show very briefly, but when you have live performers moving around, and you mentioned this yourself with electronic music as well, whether they're, you're moving electronic signals around or acoustic signals, you can, we can put a tracking system on people. And so we have these sensors you'll see on the left and these little tags you'll see on the right. And we, there's a close up of them there. I just see great opportunity with, and you know. It follows um, you around the stage. Basically. Yeah, like I've, I've done some um, live performances. We, it, a lot of it has some uh, stage performance art and it might have dancers. Yeah. Um, and for example, you had, I do a lot of co uh, codified performances where someone will walk up and down. Mm. I think this is a great opportunity you could then potentially use this. Could you use this also to modulate or send MIDI information or OSC MIDI information and affect the cut off, cut off frequency on the synthesizer? Or so you couldn't just you not just sound uh, audio mm. signals, mm. but you know actual modulation signals in in, in uh, synthesizer, well, digital synthesizer. Uh, the simple answer is that the the, the tracking system. The output from the tracking server, yep. which is, I mean, I haven't got pictures of that software, but it doesn't matter. But if you had a, this is a, a, a typical show, for example, right? Yep. There, 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 you can see the little red things of the little tracking sensors all around the room. They are all plugged into a, a, a server computer that, that outputs OSC. Okay, yeah. So that's the answer perfect. to your question is what's coming live out of this tracking system is filtered, smoothed. Yeah. X, Y, and Z separate OSC. Oh, that's a huge opportunity. So you could yeah. actually use the X parameter or the Y parameter or the, or the Z parameter to, to control what you so want. So students there, if you want to explore any of this stuff, the Max MSP will do all of that, or Max for Live with Ableton. It will be quite easy to develop something that does that with OSC. So that's a really fantastic yeah. opportunity. So it's, it's putting out OSC, and it's been used to drive video servers and lighting systems as well. And we're developing a new whole lighting app to move control moving headlights as well. And voltages, like DMX voltages? It, it, like it doesn't. No I mean, if it's OSC, you could confect Well, we, we don't do DMX. DMX now, there is a network version called it. There's two actually. Artnet and Posi Station, okay. uh, sorry, Artnet and SACN. So we will be outputting the networked version of. So yeah. we put out, oh, dozen, hundred, thirty-three thousand universes effectively. Oh, of, well, okay. of yeah. <laughs> so you will put that out if, if you need them, really. And oh. like it scares me the numbers of DMX. That's great, so yeah, just very briefly, just because somebody may be curious to know where you find this, this thing being used. That's by the way, a um, Apollo Eleven show that went up in in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, a couple of years ago, and um, as you can see, it's a kind of thrust stage, and there was they created mission control, and I think they even launched from the middle of that stage a rocket. Um, this is a typical the performance sector that we get into Broadway musicals. There's been a lot of those done with Timex. There's a few um, Tonys awards as well that have been on shows that have had. Timex on. So not all of these have got tracking. Um, some of them where they, the time, Timex has a very comprehensive queue list. So you can go, th go next, go next through a queue list and run the thing like that as well. So those kind of shows. Two of the, the top West End London shows, Harry Potter's still running. Aladdin actually moved because they wanted to put Mary Poppins in there. But there's a num quite a few shows on the West End used the Timex sound hub um, processing, spatial processing and the, uh, and the tracking system. In fact, I think all of those used our tracking, no, except for Galileo. Galileo was interesting. The music was done by, um, keep forgetting his surname, Tom Chemical, um, mm. half of the Chemical Brothers. Yeah. And it was a very high energy show. It had a 10 metre wide dome over the audience. The audience were in amongst the action and around the outside of it. And it was all, if you can imagine being Galileo, the visuals on this thing were phenomenal. Yeah. Wow. And they had just speakers everywhere. And we created lots of virtual local surrounding areas. So wherever you were sitting, you had your own. So a lot of little the audience is quite up high, isn't it? Around the Around it and beach. underneath it, lying so on cushions, yeah. yeah. So that, and that was, you know, it was a pretty high energy this was about the conflict between Galileo, obviously the church, because yep. he was very much uh, against what they were saying. <laughs> um, open air opera is a very common thing. You know, that's a 70 metre wide in a Roman uh, quarry in, uh, in Austria, 70 metre wide stage. Here it's interesting, you can't see a single speaker, they're all built into the set. And you remember we were talking about delay times that we have to manage and control to get the imaging to work. Some of the speakers in this case were built into bits of set that were moving during the show, so Crazy. Timex was managing that. Mm. changing what it did based on the fact that the speaker had actually moved. Um, wow. This is a classic, uh, I showed you an orchestra layout. Here is a phenomenal, this is, shows you the dichotomy between putting speakers on something that's 
meant to sound like an orchestra. Here, these people have bought an actual acoustic amplifier, right? That's obviously what that shell is. Mm. It's a beautiful thing, but also it's an amplifier, right? But when they, f and when they have their small audiences during their, their normal yearly, during the year, they have this kind of audience at the front. They don't need a PA, but when they fill it up for the festivals on the lawns, they have to have a PA, and they found that the contrast was too great. Yeah. So even though it's a very high quality PA, uh, just three channels of speakers, divided it up into 14 zones, put Timex on it, and it sounded like an orchestra, but loud enough for everybody. And here's the same sort of thing, open air opera, much bigger, 4,000 seats. Um, have 40 meter wide stage, that's in Hungary. Mm -hmm. um, Aida, it was, sounded amazing. I was fortunate enough to go and do that. We had 10 channels of surround there, and we had three different reverbs, one at the front for the vocals, one out wide for the orchestra, and one at the back for just low level, dark sort of, back of the room sort of thing, and it's a very good effect. And here we talked about the other end of the scale musician-wise. This was Tool, it was Progressive Metal Act, very complex musically, yep. lots of electronics, a um, lot of it coming from the drummer. And he had um, pad, pads coming up from stage that were going into a Midas, being MIDI mapped onto Timex so that the guy could pick up the first beat of a roll put that in, trigger a pan, and the next, but filter out the rest of the beat so that the rest of them didn't trigger the pan again. So, yeah. and he also had touch OSC on the iPad, so he had 24 live stems on little twiddly panners on, uh, that you could do with your fingertip as well. Yeah. And this was a very simple in, on, on, on paper system, um, not obviously in, in implementation, <laughs> and, but it was a six channel system really. Yeah. Front system, two pairs of overheads pointing forward, down and back, and then surrounds at the back and then speakers up in the, and the still bridges. a development on the traditional, but not of... the five across the front, and not just stereo, yeah. and, not, and it was uh, apparently euphoric was the best expression I heard to describe this. I didn't see it sadly, but it, it was obviously coveted. But it's coming mm. back hopefully next year. But that um, that's kind of was because you know there are people now putting five channels of speakers across the front. That's quite common now. This was considered to go beyond that as a as an enveloping experience for the whole audience, yeah. and um, and then here's a very simple. 7.1 mix in a pre-show for 100 odd people walking, standing audience, video all around them, and they just wanted it to sound just much more enveloping for everybody, and we just statically mapped the 7.1 mix of Pro Tools as it happens to the speakers that were poking through gaps in the, the video screens, and there were a couple of spot effects, time code triggered, that were very extreme pans that were done, and a big space station sound as it went oh, over wow. the top. So. Um, and then this thing that was a BBC Symphony Orchestra done in the Barbican Tunnel, where the, we had Timex was sending time code to a stack of uh, disguise video, video servers. There was 40 projectors, 40 speakers, and it, all the sound moved up and down the thing. You know, and uh, this is the road tunnel that you normally drive up to the Barbican. And uh, and then Milan Expo. Um, I think we talked about this earlier. This was not so much interactive with the people, but there were bees drive bees in a beehive. This is meant to be a virtual beehive and the message here from the artist Wolfgang Buttress was about the plight of the bees and the significance in the food chain and all that and how um, he wanted to convey that to people. And he built this vast beehive structure and had lights in it and LEDs and multi-channel sound and there was a performance content by some of the guys in Spiritualized and the cellist who was the wife of the bee specialist, you know, who's... Mm. And the, the whole thing was sort of show control triggered by um, accelerometers that were in actually in the beehives mm. and being interpreted into lighting control and triggers for the Timax, depending on the behavior of the bees. So this know. is, I would highly recommend you go and see this. This is at, um, um, it's Gardens. now at Kew Gardens. It's a 17 meter tall object. Could so be easily. Yeah. yeah, it's, I think it's got a thousand LEDs and it, it uh, it's, uh, this, the symphony, the music that's used is all in the frequency of the bees themselves. And, um, when I was there as well, you do notice because they obviously the hives they have got beehives at Q uh, at, at Q Garden, and a lot of the data is being used to actually make the lights and the music interact like from within a hive. So mm -hmm. I highly recommend you go and see that. I think it's it's staying there, isn't it? Well, like, you know, they originally commissioned it for two years, and they just said we've got to keep it because yeah. the, the visitor numbers have gone up. So it's very much. it's very evocative, mm -hmm. especially considering yeah bringing in the whole you know 
the the pollination of the bees and the importance in the ecosystem so and considering we're, we're you know bee, bee populations are so low now so mm -hmm. um it is a pretty powerful and when we go to the final lecture which is about the poetics of sound this is a good example of you know evocation what is your artistic intention and how can you achieve that through art rather than you know through standard linear talking or writing something so mm -hmm. that links in quite well with that and then just you know finally it's it's fairly obvious that we can integrate this with electronic music and and here's a, a festival system eight channels surrounding an edm act at creamfields actually <clears throat> and the guy you, you can see on the desk he has an ipad there and he can just trigger pans so this is a fairly straightforward pre-programmed pans it, sort of slightly interesting here is that they got the bpms of the various uh, tracks out and we we timed the pans to match the bpms uh, to be honest, I don't think you really need to do that. No. But he did it, <laughs> and he did it, and it was interesting. But, I mean, yeah. the reality is, is that as long as you get going round and round enough times and then hit it back on the beat when the, when they drop back in out of the, the, the uh, breakdown section. Yeah. That would be like matching an old LFO to a pan. Yeah. On it it on wasn't the really, but I don't no. always do that. But And I always say in, these con in this context that, you know, it's the breakdown sections that, that you let the time acts get in and get busy, yeah. and then when the when the when the when the DJ or the performer gets back into the to the to the groove, mm. just throw it back at them and leave it. Static. It kind of music needs an anchor, doesn't it? Yeah, in, let, in let leave that move around. In, and then you get but the breakdowns, you know, the the, the f four, eight, or sixteen bars of where they're building up or building it down. That's yeah. when this you can come in and do some really interesting stuff. Interesting. And of course, this was done with the mix, but if you can get the stems out, get the Ableton tracks out into Time Axe, it can do much more interesting things. You know, so. So just finally, the the VR I mentioned is a go was on a ride car for this Batman ride in uh, in the theme park, and it was built in doing spatial sound in every seat. So breaking it right down to yeah. four two speakers behind you, a butt kicker underneath you, and one in front of you, and it essentially was just making the sound work. And this is, this is a sort of a marketing visual of the ride. It's not it itself, but this is kind of gives you an idea. It's all built into the bit. That you can't see underneath on the tracks, synchronized to uh, show control stuff coming off the track. And the point about a Timex doing this was that all the delays could be mapped to the off-board sound as well and to the video. So this is what this actually does: is it throws you in front of a video screen, you get a tableau audio visual, then it moves you to another one, and it all has to be in sync. So there was synchronization coming off the track and then inside a cabinet in the back of the Timex. So I think, you know, I'm going to just throw this over to Ben, who now will want to sort of wind up, but I really, we really appreciate you listening, and, um, and we thought maybe we've got more of these, but Q&A if you're interested, you know? Yeah, so um, feel free to send us over any questions. Um, if you don't want to do this now and you want to do it a little bit later after you've had time to digest then um, feel free to do that. But uh, um, we've got the, um, the conversation open here. Um, so if anyone wants to in, uh, send us a, a question or we can have a few questions. I, th I think I've maybe exceeded my limit of questions because I'm got, so interested. I've got a couple more examples I'm happy to just tell you about. I think, I mean, yeah, just, I think that would be a good idea a if we can have a little look. Just yeah. curious to see, it, it, many of you, if you've been following the live sound phenomenon these days, will have seen uh, all these extra speakers sprouting across the front of uh, rock gigs, right? So this is, and there's things from um, very worthy outfits like DMB Audio Technics have done a thing called Soundscape, and Mel um, Acoustics have done a thing called Elisa. Elisa is essentially a level panner, and Soundscape is the closest there is to a time accident. It's using delay, um, and um, it, it involves basically spreading the PA out across the front of the audience and, and making it more kind of spatial and panoramic. And this one here actually uses an LQ6 system. What the guy liked about the Timex was that this is in, um, believe it, although it's called Kensington, it's actually a Dutch band, an indie band. Um, and they, he liked the fact that he was not restricted to where he had to place the speakers. He could be quite flexible with it because the lines of sight mattered. You can't see it here, but there's lots of screens behind the band that he was had to allow good line of sight for. So the, the, the time axe flexibility and being able to spatially map 
um, not literally regardless of where you put the speakers, but much you're much less tied tied down than you might be with some things. Yeah, oh, just, that's just, just can I quickly jump in there? Sorry to yeah. stop you right. there, but just there's a couple of little comments and questions here I think might be okay, interesting go to nuts. bring up. Mm -hmm. But we have uh, uh, some comments and uh, questions here from Chris uh, Manolis. Thank you very much, Chris. Hi, Chris. Um, says, uh, first off, thank you. Very insightful and informative presentation. Wouldn't expect anything less than from your day if your <laughs> reputation precedes you uh, by the looks of things. But Chris goes into uh, um, the VR. Regarding the VR mixed reality aspect, is this something that's already happening within the industry in a big way? Is it being kind of supported, I guess? If not, something that he sees becoming a big thing moving forward. And also, are there any particular aspects of the use of the system that would be different to what is happening with other live performances? They're two separate things. Right, but. Right. We get asked a lot about this, and we now we now mention that the VR was a term used because we couldn't think what to call it for something that was going on a, on a, a ride car thing, and um, it was sort of a semi VR environment because it is a, a mixed reality thing or a ride dark ride as they call it. Yeah. What's interesting is that a lot of people that are coming out, especially young people coming out of the college environment, are, are learning about mixing for Unreal and these kind of things, yeah. Unity. Um, and that we, we do trade shows, essentially. We do theme park trade shows and we do um, you know, professional audio trade shows. And a lot of these young, um, people of your kind of generation come up to us and go, we've, we've learned a lot about spatial audio, but basically for headphones. Yeah. And we're now encountering this demand. We're being told that we've got to put it into spaces and we don't kind of really, that doesn't really, um, it's not something that we, we is, con is contextual to what we, we kind of encountered. In, yeah, in those this is devices. what Chris actually expands and, upon. And the, one of the reasons is that things like this, things like these these rides, yeah. the, the what's being generated in games in Unreal and that, those are becoming um, experiences. Yeah. So they are now being having to present to, we'll call them audiences, but and let's say visitors. They're becoming platforms for so, so you have to now put things, those yeah. out into multiple large spaces with lots of people there, you know. So they could be arena shows or they could be... Uh, or they could be, you know, rides or something like that. So they were very interested in how to translate what they've learned, how to do these very advanced techniques for in those kind of platforms, how they can interpret, take that out of the headphones and into the live spaces. And so we were showing them that with the time axe allows you to do that, you know? Because yeah. uh, Chris expands upon that and says he believes it's it, it currently seems that VR and mixed rea reality develops seems to be heavily biased towards binaural so soundtracks delivered through headphones. Mm -hmm. But I can imagine that big scale multi-user mixed reality events are coming. I mean, it's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. um, Chris continues there to expand that. He's not sure audiences will be happy to have all audio delivered through headphones over long periods of time. So this is an interesting point, which I was alluding to earlier in, in the presentation mm. about the future of mainstream um, <coughs> music performance. You know, at the moment, we might be a little bit binaural-centric um, at the moment with regards to these, um, but can you see maybe these, you know, these shared experiences or expanding, virtual reality sp expanding, or augmented reality expanding mm. outside of the binaural world in, into the more highly spatialised live environment? Well, uh, do you have any like inqu inquiries or inquiries from artists at the moment looking to do things like that? My, for, if I could for put in the live performance arena aside for the minute, the, the theme park industry, the experiential yeah. market, <clears throat> As, as an interesting example of that, because we do a trade show, which is the theme park show in Florida every year, not this year actually for obvious reasons, but, and um, one of the things you see there are a lot of goggles these days, right? Because, yeah. and you see goggles on people in seats that are being thrown around, but wearing goggles. It's a lot cheaper to put it into goggles than it is to build a massive, great structure yeah. to, to throw them around in. You can easily simulate the, the throwing around in the seat thing, but what what we well, the conversations we have with some of the people doing the sound design for that is we go why don't they put headphones on them and they go mm. there, there is a huge resistance yeah. to putting headphones on because suddenly one thing is that they might not they probably don't even need to go to the theme park anymore they can buy a, a haptic seat and do it at home right yeah. so it's not good for the money and also it's just too enclosing an experience. There is something about the space that we experience and also the interaction between the people that we're enjoying. It's one of the reasons why when you go to a live show, what's happening around yeah. you is as important as what's happening in front but of there's you. There's oral diversities so, as well because people have such wide range in oral mm -hmm. diversities in mm -hmm. volume and tone and interpretation that I think 
I know that some people get a very physical negative reaction mm. from things being a certain. It's yeah. difficult to have a unified mm. decibel level or sound yeah. level when there's so much all diversity in the headphones. Mm. That would in some way need to be uh, adaptive. That's based on some of the research mm. I've read. Mm. But also, I think it's an interesting point you made about you know moving away from the live performance into the theatre experiential. I think there could be an argument to be made where the experiential is the future. Of live music. Well, when I said experiential, I did. Sorry, I meant the theme park yeah, environment. Yeah, yeah. But to sure. talk about the theatre, there are theatre shows that have been done. I'm going. This is going the other direction. Have been done yeah. binaurally, as you probably know, and, yeah. and award-winning ones that have been done binaurally, and that's an area of experimentation that is that has been growing. But I think yeah. people still or a combination of all of it. People still recognise the benefit of of sharing the experience. Yeah. And you know, I think coming out of what we've just been through, it might actually be an interesting thing that there's maybe a backlash against enclosing people too much. And, yeah. and certainly the, I found it interesting because the economics of putting headphones on people in theme parks is very compelling. Yeah. But they said, no, we, we, we want a space. We, we, yeah. And also you can't hear your the people you're with screaming, you know, things like that, as simple as that. But this really. leads nicely in the segue into the next lecture where we talk about sh uh, shared altered states of consciousness mm -hmm. through the transcendental event, as Tony likes to refer it to. These transcendental uh, events only really occur when you have a group of people together mm -hmm. listening to the same thing and feeling the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. So there must be something to be said about a shared altered state as opposed to an individualised experience with headphones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a, it's a fascinating thing to explore. Mm -hmm. I mean, from my perspective, I see theatre, music performance uh, and theme park, this whole web of experiential as becoming the new music performance mm -hmm. where you walk in, it's part theatre, mm -hmm. it's part yeah, yeah. music, and it will all mm -hmm. become in one. I mean, I've been lucky to have been invited on a, to perform on some of these one of them was based uh, on uh, a science research project to sleeping people, where you perform to mm. sleeping people. And the whole um, experience of that is curated mm -hmm. from yeah. the lighting to the walk to the acoustics of where they walk through mm -hmm. um, to headphones and then non-headphones and speakers. Mm. So mm. It, 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 there's a wonderful opportunity to get on board these technologies and understand to kind of sum up what we've gone over, understand psychoacoustics, to understand the reasons why our brains interpret and uh, perceive these things. So then we can use that when we conceptualise a performance or try and utilise these uh, these technologies. So uh, I don't know how your, your chat is going. But, uh... um, I think that's we pretty much covered everything okay. in how the chat. How for time? I mean, do you want to see a few more of these or...? Uh... I think if you've got some stuff ready... Well, this, this was an interesting one. Going, going, well, it's not quite a mixed reality thing, but it, it's a mixed sensory thing, certainly. The, we were involved in a thing called Soundscapes some years ago at the National. Um, there's a Sainsbury wing at the National where they put on things like, you know, exhibitions, which summer exhibitions for three months. And here they decided to experiment with putting a, a, this, this on, which is sort of um, not just hanging paintings or putting in sculptures. Um, fairly... Um, for a traditional gallery like this, fairly kind of uh, controversial, it has mm. to be said, and it, mm. and it was controversial to the in, to the industry. But what it, what it was essentially, they asked people from five different people from, let's just say, sonic disciplines for the moment. It'll be clear why I've said that to start with. But to select from the from the collection a single art item, and that could be a sculpture or a picture or whatever. And, um, and then do an interpretation in, in sound, and so they would create soundscapes. And so there was um, a painting of a, of a lakeside in Finland that Chris Watson, who's a sound recordist for, for the BBC, goes out and does sound for recordings beautifully. One of the Attenborough so, programmes, yeah. yeah. And he did, he did a room with four channels, four speakers in there, and just this fab fabulous kind of lakeside uh, forest um, and, um, you know, Old tribesmen on a mountain, Yoi King, as the expression was, you know, mm. uh, actually uh, communicating with the gods on the mountain and stuff. Um, and then there was a, a true a, a, a consortium of two people, true sonic artists that took a piece, built a structure, and then it was a three dimensional version of actually what was in the picture, and then created a little sound story within it. Um, there was a guy who used a, um, a you know, stringed instrument cross between a, uh, a viola and a cello, I would call it. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it will come to me. Um, had 50 of those, five sets of drones, 
multiple kind of, you might say, solo tracks, but melody tracks. And they'd move, because the piece was a, a triptych, uh, a Richard III's actual portable altarpiece that he would, you know, worship at as he was on his, on touring around, it was in a, in a cabinet and you walked around it to look at it from different angles. So there were speakers all around the walls and the music moved around as well. And that was quite a fascinating one because it was a 20 minute loop, 25 minute loop, but it, and it was very kind of uneventful except for lots of little occasional electronic stabs in it as well. But it was very kind of um, seductive, I guess mm. is the word. You just got to sink into this thing, you know. And Sounds then, like a lot of Brian Eno's work in some hospitals that he's it would be it would be us. similar. I mean, it, it was tuneful, right? But yeah. it was um, <clears throat> definitely didn't have verse chorus or anything like that going on. Um, <clears throat> and so initially you'd think, well, this is a bit samey. But then you'd listen to it. I mean, obviously I heard it through a few times. I sat and mixed it with the guy. Mm. He had a sound designer who was, let's make it do this kind of thing. Um, and then in, in this room that you're looking at here was the complete opposite end of the scale, uh, Jamie XX, who we obviously know as electronic uh, DJ, musician, producer, etc. In the band the XX it, as well. The, from yeah. the XX, and he he selected a pointillist painting, which which he, um, is made up of dots, of course, right? And so he decided that the con the music track that he created, which was basically a three and a half inch classic Jamie XX electronic track, right? would start when you walked in the room at this end, where we are looking at it, as a mix. And there were basically four channels, you know, two behind, two in front. And you just had this kind of Sonos type surround mix, if you like, you know. And then as you walked down the room, there were rows of four speakers up in the ceiling that you couldn't see. And then four more in the wall either side of the painting and some subs and stuff buried in the walls. And the, there's the... Um, this, this pattern on the tiles was actually designed to make you walk towards it, interestingly mm. enough. And it was, it would, the sound would fragment because he wanted the sound to, 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 to basically go pointillist on you. So yeah. as you got nearer it, what, what was this looping track, and it was only about three and a half minutes. Like it, a granulization. It, absolutely, and you, yeah. couldn't, you couldn't actually hear the beginning and end of this track, which was quite, quite good, yeah. quite well written. But it just went around, and people would come in and sit down in this one because it was so short, you'd think, oh, well, they'll come through, but they'll go, I hear something different each time, you know? Yeah. And um, so people would spend a little bit of time in there um, because they were getting different things and they just wanted to, and then move, move around. Oh, it sounds different over here mm. to over here and that kind of thing. So it was you interesting. You create your own mix depending how much diffusion you want and how much like clarity you want in the competition. That's quite interesting. Now as artists, potentially before you get too excited, it got slated by the critics. Oh, did so, it? <laughs> What the critics know, eh? So on a more mundane level, all of this comes together <laughs> on a, in the commercial world in cruise but now, ships. But now, because he's failed that, Jamie Excess is going to go, go and work on the cruise ship. There you go. He's now, that's all, he's done, all he does now. <laughs> and we do a lot of it, large open air festival stuff, specialisation. Uh, I thought, do you work at... Marching band stuff and that kind of thing. Sorry to interrupt. Did you, right. Do you work at the, amphith the Roman amphitheatre um, music venue? I can't remember what it's called. The Colosseum. It's the, the Colosseum, not the actual Colosseum, mm. but that amphitheatre, because I went there a few years back to see a Bjork um, performance with an orchestra, and I didn't know whether it was the amphitheatre um, um, actual design, but it did seem to me that no matter where I was in that mm. space, there was this kind of replicable sound. I well, just didn't know whether she, you were working there. She has been, I don't know when or how long ago it was, but she has been using a, another spatial audio platform yeah. on tour, but it was only really in the last year or so. Okay. Year or two. Oh, no, it won't be, it could be two years ago. Cause Maybe that's just the, the architectural yeah. innovations of the Roman well, space. To be honest, if there was no amplification, it would spatialise naturally. Yeah, yeah. yeah this, this amplification true. stuff just messes things up. That's the, that's why we where we come in, right? Where yeah. we try and make it... And correct it, yeah. I mean, this is quite bizarre, just to leave you with a, something to scratch your head over. You know, I've been telling you about pointing speakers at people and delaying them to zones on stage. And we we had this client who who owns Timex, and, and he... Uh, he had to go through this festival with, as the kind of guest engineer, for the kind of white gloves engineer for his one of his touring artists who was this, let's call him, you know, operatic crooner. He'd done pop operatic tunes, right? So he was just doing one, one night at this, this venue and the rest of the acts were people like Nick Cave. So it was a multi kind of level stuff, you know? Yeah. And he thought, I wonder if I can take a conventional stereo PA system and plug a Timex into it and instead of using pan pots to make the orchestra, you do this, delay, do this delay matrix yeah. thing we've talked about, but without all the speakers in the middle that we'd ideally like to have. And he, he said it was interesting because 
I didn't have much time, so I was able to use the cal that's the screen down on the right. You see, yeah. I was able to use the calculation and the time action and hit calculate. Boom, works it's a very out. clear visual interface, isn't it? Works like, all the numbers very, out. Yeah. And he said we pushed the faders up, and it sounded like a real orchestra. And 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 he, if he'd asked us, will this work? I'd have said no. <laughs> I don't know well, about that. Shows but shows you the he, merit of experiment, experimenting But the with guy, these the guy is, a, is an exact... If it hadn't worked, he'd told us. Yeah. We, we, but we made no claims. So it is interesting how having the versatility of this platform means that you aren't quite so locked in. I'm sort of doing a little bit of trumpet play, blowing here that it was able to take even this space sound system that wasn't really designed to do it and do a... Now, one of the things that the benefit is that there is a real orchestra that to anchor on to. So, so that, that leads you into yeah. the perception of it sounding, yeah. So that's it. That's all the examples I've got. There's lots more on the website, but you know, overall, thank you very much. Oh, thank you so been my absolutely and Thank my you pleasure. for listening to us <laughs> talk and uh, go on and show you stuff. Yeah, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Thank you good. very much. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to give you a little one of those. No, no, no. Please don't. <laughs>